Hello guys, welcome to class. Sorry, I forgot to remove the little covering from that. Welcome to CS202 Online, week two, day one of week two, or shall we say, fourth video on the series. Hope you guys all had a good weekend. There we go. Hopefully you all are making good progress in your homework assignments. More homework on the way pretty soon, so. Make sure you're well cut up on that. And uh, did I miss you? You know, I mean, you guys are on Discord every day, so I, I, I it's not like we, we, we all hadn't been in touch for the past three days. So I, I'd say there was nothing to miss. Um, plus, technically, for, I mean, like you guys see me, I just see text. I see text here or on Discord. For me, it's the same. It's more like for you guys, you don't see me. You just see text for the days that we don't have class. So, if anything is, if you guys miss me, I suppose. But, anyways, um, let's go ahead and review a little bit of what we did last time. So, we're going to continue talking about inheritance and composition today and aggregation, um, and see a flicker that happened earlier in the class and in, in the other class one of my light bulbs will be going out so uh, anyways we are going to continue uh, talking about these two topics and we will finish them today more than likely and if so we will introduce pointers but uh, yeah so what is inheritance and composition uh, again inheritance the main one that we were going to we were discussing was the idea of making a parent class that you can then sort of base a child class out of which is basically expanding or extending the functionality or the data that the, 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 the class can store right so if you have a class for something like a rectangle or, or a square your extended class might be a cube which is all the information that a square or a rectangle has but now you add a, another variable to it you add def and in, you know in addition to this you may want to add functionality such as computing the um, volume of a cube right instead of just the area the area you might still want to keep the surface area but in that case you may need to modify your area function because now instead of just area thinking of like one face with a cube you might want multiple faces so ultimately you can add stuff to your derived classes you can override stuff completely so you can change existing functionality and also you can add data so you by stuff really I mean you can add you can add data and then you can either change or, or change functionality or add new functionality entirely okay so with the square you can add a dimension to make the depth and it becomes a cube and with that you need to add functionality such as computing the volume and you can modify existing functionality such as modifying how the area works because now the area needs to be computed on not just one face but six faces because it's a cube right so that's kind of the idea of inheritance and with inheritance when i showed you we uh we run into a situation when we're trying to access data from the parent class and that is uh if the data is stored as a private variable while you do have it in the derived class so when you inherit from a class that has private variables or private functions you have them in the class like they're actually existing in memory especially for variables but you can't access them you can't access it like you could when you're in the class where you made things and that's because private variables when you inherit them they become inaccessible to the derived class if you have public getters and setters you can still access the data which proves to you that the variables do exist it's just not easily accessible so more than likely if you intend to expand in functionality and want to have access to those variables just to make your life easier after all you're doing inheritance to make your life as a programmer easier not harder so if you still want to be able to access the data but you still want to keep the advantage of making something private in the sense that outside of the class you can't accidentally modify it and break it that's when we introduce protected into into the uh, picture here so a protected variable is going to for all sense and purposes work the same way as a private variable when you're talking about a single class and that is it's only going to be available to the class variables or functions protector protected there we go so essentially if we have a protected variable x and we want to modify it within the class we can modify it just like any other variable a function can modify it if we have a protected function it can only be called by other class functions it cannot be called outside the class 
If you want something available outside the class, then we make it public. And then, as long as they have an object, then they can deref they can basically use the member access operator and access any of the variables. So really protected where that kind of deviates from private comes in your derived classes. In your derived classes, protected variables can be accessed as if they were the class's private variables in the sense you can go in there and, and, and read the data and potentially modify it. So really, if all you want to keep is the same functionality of having private variables be only available to the class and public ones being public to everybody, then just make your private variables protected. That way, when you inherit, they will remain that way. There is one more thing about that though. When you do inheritance, you say something like class A, well, let's say you have a class A, okay? Here's a class A, and maybe there's an int x. Now, because I'm not putting any um, modifiers there, then this is by default private, because we said classes by default are private unless we put public. So when I go ahead and inherit, so I'm creating class B, inheriting from A, like that, if I don't put anything here, then I am inheriting privately, which means that any variables here, whether they were public, protected, or private, are going to automatically become private. And that sort of defeats the purpose of, of this. So even, even if I go in here and add the keyword protected, I'm still inheriting privately. If I want to inherit with, uh, with the same functionality as this with protected, I could list here protected, and that is going to then, yes, I will be able to access x here. So if I have a function here called void foo, and then here I say c out x, then this will work just fine. However, if I put public here, this will also work fine. So what is the difference? Okay, to understand that difference, let's go ahead and add a public variable. Public. Okay, so now here's the difference. If I go ahead and main and I create a variable of object A or class A, so an object A, let's call it just A. I can do this a y equals five. I can do that because a is an integer, or sorry, y is an integer and it's public variable. I cannot do a dot x gets five because that's protected. And or if it was private, neither of them I could do it. So that's okay, we all understand that much. Cool. Let's go ahead and switch it around and use a b now. If I do b like this, I still can't do b dot x because that is being inherited, private, uh, protected, you know. And also, in this scenario here, I can do this. I can do b dot y. This one will be okay. This one will not be okay. So we use green to signify yes. These are all okay. Red does not. It does not compile. So here's the thing. First of all, if I'm putting public here, why is this not public? If I'm saying to inherit publicly, the B dot X. The reason is because you can't make something less secure per se. You can only make it more secure. So if I put the public modifier here, what I'm saying is take any variable here that's private and keep it private. Take any variable that's protected and keep it protected. And then take any variable that's public and make it make sure that it remains public okay now if i go ahead and switch this over to protected here if i can if i can spell it right then i'm going to take any private variable and keep it private i'm going to take any uh protected variable and keep it protected and I'm gonna take any public variable and I'm gonna convert it into protected. So that means that if I did this like this, then this line of code would no longer be okay because this is protected variable. So that would not work. So 
I can only sort of raise the security but not lower it. Now, if I put this as private here, you know, if I, if, or, or basically not put anything, which by default will make it private. In that case, private variables will remain private. Protected variables will not become private and public variables will not become private. So in that sense, I will not be able to add to, uh, to see out any of them. However, they will become private to that function, to that class, which means that you, you would be able to, uh, to access them per se. Okay. So, yeah, let's code that one so you can see it. Let's code that one because that's actually a good example because it's a little tricky. Okay. So let's go ahead and do include namespace std name and then class a int x public int y protected. Okay. And so now let's go ahead and make the inherited class. Class B inherits from A. We'll do it privately first. And then um, void foo C out X and Okay. And so now this will be okay. A dot Y gets five. The one that's not okay is going to be if we try to do X equals like two. Okay. That one will not compile. So let's comment this one out first to see that everything is good. I don't have any typos in here. Okay, so everything is good. But now the problem comes in if I try to do this, I am going to get an error saying that the variable is not available because it is protected. Whereas if it was private, I get an error that says it's private. So you get a different error for either of them. Now, here's the thing. So I'll leave this one in here, but I'll comment it out saying it is bad. Okay, let's make a variable of class B. So instantiate an object of type B. And then go ahead and try to do B dot Y gets four. Okay, if we have public here, this will work just fine. However, if I try to access the X, which is protected in the parent, in the parent class, and this shouldn't work either way. So it doesn't. So you can't make it less secure because by saying, yeah, make it public. No, 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 it's protected. It's only going to become more secure, not less. So it would stay protected and it will still not work. Okay. Now as for the deal with Y, right now by doing it public, it works okay. But if I switch this over to protected, now that variable is going to be protected and b.y would not work. This is inaccessible. Okay. Now let's go uh, further here. Without either of them, if I compile, this compiles just fine because this x is protected. If I switch this to private, it should still be okay. As you can see, I'm still okay. In fact, I can access, even though this is protected, it became private here, but that's okay because it became private for this class and we won't feel the effect unless we try to inherit from this class, okay? However, if I try to switch this up here to private, then I'm gonna get an error saying that I can't, even though I, I say private here, what the problem is happening that when it becomes private here, the X here, it cannot access it because it's private. So whenever you want to inherit, you need to use protected. Now, because here I inherited as private, if I try to do a class C that inherited from B, even if I say that it inherits publicly from B, you know, this, this will compile uh, like this. Yeah, it will compile. However, 
if I try to create another function that, that works kind of like foo called maybe bar this is when I'm gonna run into problems because even though it was protected here I inherited privately which means it became a private variable here so when I inherit it from B into C at that point this was already private and so it didn't matter that it was public it inherited it, it already as a private which will not be okay so you can convert it into private when you inherit it and it will still be okay just for your class but not for any derived classes so if my goal is to have a class C more than likely at the very least I want to make this protected so that it gets inherited protected and then it can remain accessible here although like I said 99% of the time you will probably use public here because public just kind of guarantees that the status quo remains public or public privates which shouldn't be passed will not be passed and protected will remain protected so keep the status quo per se and do public okay so questions on that guys that's uh that's kind of wrapping up last classes sort of idea can you repeat what happens if the child class inherits protected if the child class inherits protected well okay we have to understand what I mean by inherit and protected. If the, the if the parent variable is protected and you inherit, and then say you inherit publicly, then it remains protected. If you inherit protected here, then it remains protected as well. Again, but if you inherit privately, then even though it was protected here, it is now a private variable in this context. Which means that if I inherit again, then I won't I won't be able to use it in the, here. I won't be able to access it. So. If I put private here, or just simply not put anything, which by default is private, in that case, then I'm going to have problems when I do the second in inheritance. I won't have problems here because it's private within this context. It will be the same thing as if I wrote a variable here, private, and called it int g. So basically, if the child class inherits protected, it can access it within as if it was its own variable. The private ones, it cannot access within that scope. It can only access the ones that you made private locally or protected ones that it inherited. Or I guess your own local protected as well. If I if I decided to put another protected variable here for some for some reason like that. Ooh, let's not do that because that's weird naming convention. So yeah. So hopefully that answers that. Any other questions about inheritance? Now's your chance. Ask them if you don't understand because uh, we will be using it quite quite a bit especially when we get to talking about virtuals you have to make sure that you understand the basics of inheritance now something that you should notice from what I did here is that I did do sort of two layers of inheritance and I can keep going as much as I want per se um, this is going to introduce another problem that I kind of want to talk about here let's uh, you guys ask questions and in the meantime I'm going to type an example here Yeah, let's do that. Okay. So we got class A. Class B gets from A. Class C gets from B. We can get rid of this. Actually, we don't need this one for what I'm about to show you. Actually, to simplify things, let's just do this. And then class GG gets public uh, C can one class be inherited multiple times yes that's what I was going to uh, to to get to here you you get into so C++ allows multiple inheritance and uh, in addition to that you can sort of do this weird uh, this is an example that I give the class is like inbreeding between inheritance so let's let's kind of let's talk about the inbreeding in C++ basically so first of all let's talk about the simplest term suppose that you have two classes that you want to inherit from so let's say you have class A and then you have class Z which has a public variable called int um, I'm running out of ideas for variables here H okay I can create a class U that inherits from both A and Z. I got too many classes in here. 
Oh, I made well, I made a C uppercase here. There we go. Okay. Wow. And then this one. Okay, we'll see that. And there we go. Okay, cool. So for now, ignore the bottom side. Let's look at this top side. Okay. So I got my class A and I got a class Z. Class Z has a variable int H and class A has Y and X. I can inherit from both A and Z to create sort of a, a, a new class. So you can think of that as like the child of a couple. Okay. But this is okay because like the mom and the dad per se are different. They're different classes. They came from completely different lines per se. There's nothing that interchanges in the top. There's no inbreeding per, per se. So this is okay in that th those, those will not have conflicts. And what's going to happen is that class U is going to have a Y, it's going to have an X, and it's going to have an H. And it's going to treat it all as if it's, if it's just one big mix. So I guess this goes a little bit different from genetics where like you get half from your dad and half your mom. No, here you get 100 from both. So you got 200% of the stuff in here, okay? So uh, that's gonna be what is known as multiple inheritance. And not all languages allow that. So C++ is like, yeah, that's fine. You can do it. Other languages, like I believe Java, do not allow multiple inheritance. You work around that by using what I believe are known as, uh, not extends, but abstract classes. No, what's the name of it? Interfaces, interfaces. I think it's interfaces. So you use multiple interfaces. You can do multiple in interfaces to uh, mimic multiple inheritance in, in in Java. So if if you uh, if you know. So if you modify int text in one class, will it affect the other classes that inherited X? Um, well, let's see if I understand what you're saying. If I modify X here, like if I go ahead and initialize this to always be, I don't know, seven then any any class that uses x will have it so for so, so this class here will will have an x that is initialized to seven uh if i add variables here then they will be added here so will y x and h all be private in class u yes because i i i, I inherit it privately but they will be able to be accessible here because originally they were not private so they will be accessible but they will all be set to private if i want to make them public I can't just do this for both. I have to manually specify for each one like that. Okay. Uh, this is a, a typical amateur mistake to make is to just do this. Uh, that's why I didn't put it yet. Cause I wanted to, to uh, bring it up. If you would do something like this with public AZ and you're thinking, Oh yeah, that's inheriting both A and C publicly. No, you are forced to put the modifier after each inheritance. So you have to do this because that allows you actually the ability. If you want to inherit something protected or private, you can there. You don't have to do it all a cover all per se. So, uh, yes, you have to put that modifier. Just remember that because, I, I, like I said, a lot of people have that issue the, the first time they kind of learn this because it sort of seems like it would make sense to just have it once and put a, and list them all. It's kind of like uh, when you think about Boolean logic and, and you say something like A is less uh, five, 6 is less than X, which is less than 10. You know, this makes sense in math, and you might be tempted to close an if statement saying this. And then work in Python and some languages, but not in C++. This has to be split into two things. This has to be split into 6 is less than x and x is less than 10. You know, now you have the same validity in the statement here. Um, yeah. So kind of how you have to separate that and call x for each one. You can think of that as with the modifiers, okay? And then we, and yeah, that was all the questions that we had. So, uh, yes. Um... Anyways, back to this. So uh, let's go ahead and cause potential issues here, okay? So what if, even though they're not coming from the same inheritance, um, I was complaining because I, I do the initialization there, it's okay. What if I try to have a variable that is a shared variable name, okay? There you go, we have the first person that ever redeemed extra credit, so. There you go. Ask him if you have questions, or him or her. I don't know if you have questions on uh, how to redeem that because he figured it out. So now that you redeemed it, DM me on on Discord your name so that I know who to give the points to because I don't know if there's anybody called Spottiest in the canvas. <laughs> so yes, just DM me, and then you can DM me now. I'm not gonna check it now so you don't forget. But make sure you DM me. Otherwise, I don't know who to give the points to. Like who's Spottiest? You know? uh, 
well, you might be spotty on Discord, but that doesn't tell me who you are on Canvas. Like, is there some? Am I, am I going to give an A in the transcript? You know, when you get your transcript, it's going to say, instead of saying your real name, it's going to say Spottiest. And you're going to go to show up to your job and be like, this is my transcript. It says Spottiest because I thought that was my name. Well, no, you got to tell me who you actually are, right? <laughs> so, yeah. Anyways, uh, so yeah, just message me on Discord your name. And just do that, even though the first time you do it, you do it every single time you get the points. Because then I can just scroll up and see your name easier. I don't have to remember it. Uh, but anyways, so um, I'm just picking on you because you're the first one. So, yeah. All right, so, um, yeah, so I wanted to, to, to give you a, an issue, but before I do, let me just go ahead and uh, and prove to you that this is still okay by saying uh, something like void foo c out um, y, x, and h, just to prove to you that all those variables exist in an object of you. So I can do something like you, you, and then call you foo. And uh, yeah, okay. So compile and run. Void foo. Oh, well, fail. Um, foo is private, so this also applies to functions, just like it does to variables. Uh, there we go. Okay, so we got 0, 7, 0. We never initialize the variables. That's a bad thing. So let's go ahead and initialize them. This is one. Two, this one we had initialized one two and three just to make it easier to keep track of the variables because things are going to get messy pretty quickly here one two three yay so uh okay as you can see class u contains basically all of mom's variables and that's variables or whatever right okay now suppose just to make things tricky that even though they're different classes and they don't share a common ancestor like i'll show you in a bit suppose that there was an x in um, in Z okay and now now we have a bit of an issue here if I uh, compile I'm gonna get an error I'm not it's not necessarily bad like for example here if I if I remove the X from printing it then I believe that it will compile just fine um, H was not the current scope oh yeah <laughs> I removed it bye bye so here I'll leave H as I had it but let's just add an X beneath it, like that. Because I do want to keep my H there for, for other purposes. So yeah, okay, so this will compile and run just fine. You know, I have, but here's the thing. You should be asking yourself, okay, there's a Y and an X from here and there's an H in the next. Does that mean that I have two X's? Ooh, we have a bit of an internet lag there for a second. Does that mean that I have two X's in my U or do I have one because I had two variables called x, you know, it's a it's a perfectly good and valid question to have. And what happens if I say c out x? Well, you saw that already. It gives me an error saying it's ambiguous, and that should give you a hint to the fact that there's actually two x's in. So that means two variables called x inside of u. You have the two of the same. It says here reference to x is ambiguous. And the candidates are ZX and AX. So that gives you a hint on how to solve this ambiguity. This ambiguity means that we do have two copies of X, but the compiler is okay with that because technically they're referred to as differently. They're referred to as mom's X and dad's X per se. And so that's going to be what the scope resolution operator is in the class name. So it's saying class Z X and class A's X. And that is basically the solution to this. So if we make this X have maybe like a four in it, just so you can see the difference between them, then uh, the way we would print it out is we can say Z scope brass operator that, and notice that I'm putting in the class name and not an object name. That's okay because the only reason we're putting it is just to clear the ambiguity for the compiler on whose X we are talking about, you know? And then A's X. Why is, oh, I see one too many. And so now I should be okay with that problem. So one, four, two, three. That's because I printed out one, and then this four, and then two, three. So yeah. So even though this is a good solution to this problem, that is more inherently of a design problem if you have something like this. Because why do you have two x's? Is that what you meant to do? Like, do these x's actually represent the same thing, and you intended them to be shared, like to be just one variable? Like maybe, maybe you had um. Maybe the X was the ID and class A has an ID system and so does class Z. 
And now with class U, you ended up with two IDs when it really should only have one. So how do you actually really solve this problem? This is a design problem and not a programming problem. This is a, this is a sign that maybe both class A and Z should share a parent class that just contains the X. And both of them can inherit from that to avoid this ambiguity so that there's always only one X. So let's go ahead and solve that. Let's call this the granddaddy class. Granddaddy class, I guess, I don't know. I think I might've put one too many Ds in that, I don't know. So uh, in this class, we're gonna say that now we got our public, cause it's public in both of them. index and so now we can go ahead and inherit from that class and we no longer oh I guess it was protected here so mm, that's a that's a bit of an issue if we really want to maintain that sort of protected in that one and the other one that could cause some potential problems I suppose one solution could be to inherit protected yeah that'll take care of that That'll make it a protected variable. So yeah, we solved that problem there. So now we don't need this here. And then um, in this one, we will inherit publicly because we want it to be public. <laughs> yes, this will be good. This will show you quite a bit of an issue here. Okay. So this, might, this is actually, I suppose, a naive way of doing this. Um, okay, so then you're like, okay, I, um, you know, I inherited because of the granddaddy class, and uh, now there's only one of them. I only see one X, you know, I see it in granddaddy, so I should be able to do C out Y, X, and H, right? Right, that's the hopes and dreams of that. But I still have the same problem. Because now, technically, I did inbreeding here, right? Because my idea was, okay, well, there's only one to be one X, but here's the problem. Both of them still inherit one X. So by the time it gets to the grandkid, they are still getting an X from both sides. This is what is known more purely as the diamond problem. And the diamond problem is a, is a, is a big thing in C++. So I'm going to take time to actually write the word diamond problem in the notes here. And it's a problem that is the reason why, as I said earlier, languages like Java do not allow multiple inheritance because of avoiding programmers from accidentally doing the diamond problem, okay? The diamond problem is when you have a super class called, say, you know, A, and then you have a class B and C that inherit from that super class, and then you have a class D that inherits from the parent. So basically, you, you have your inbreeding in a way, okay? So yes. Well, the reason I chose those names is because in a way it is, it's a good, you know, you can think of like the inbreeding example of like, you know, now mom and dad share a granddaddy, which means that mom and dad are, are brother sister. So that causes genetical problems, genetic problems, right? And so it also causes problems in programming. So it's easy for people to remember that example, I guess. It's a little bit dark, I suppose. Um, okay. So anyways. The diamond problem is uh, is solved using something that I'm not going to show you yet, but that is virtual and virtual inheritance and virtual functions, depending on the kind of situation you have with the with the diamond problem. But I suppose I'll show you a hint of how we would solve that. And by the way, we can still sort of work around that by having one of each. So we can still use what we had before, you know, but. Oh, well, we have, the reason we get a big number is because we didn't initialize those things. So, uh, yeah, we can initialize that. And I suppose if we still wanted to set the original values for each of them, we could use a constructor to uh, set things up, you know, because right now we have two of them with the same value. But, uh, yeah, I, I, uh, if you wanted to, um, to solve this, and we will talk about it, is you put the word virtual, uh, I think, in just one of these. It's been a while since I tried to solve this problem. So now let me uh, let me see if that solved it. I think it 
think you do it there. Uh, okay, not not there. So then uh, maybe you do it on the on this class maybe on the grandchild class. I think it might be. Mm, let's just see what. Let's just try to put it in both of these levels. I don't think you do it in the original class. There we go. Okay, so you put virtual in both the mom and dad. Oh, apologies for that. Yeah, yeah, apologies for that. I shall switch over. Yeah, so um, let me undo what I did, and then I'll show you. So we we have our, our, our multiple inheritance problem here, diamond problem, and then uh, this, of course, gives us the same ambiguity error of that. We can still sort of, quote, unquote, solve it by referring to each variable individually. You know, we have two of them. But um, again, they're two separate variables, which is a really bad idea because if you have a function that is modifying one of them here and one of them is modifying it here, then you're just keeping two completely different counts, which is really bad, unless that's what you intended, in which case, why would you choose the same variable name for both? So if we want to solve the problem, if we want to solve the problem of virtual inheritance, what we have to do is you, uh, is to solve the diamond problem, we have to do is use something that's known as virtual inheritance. Uh, wow, you have a big, you guys have a big delay on the video. <laughs> I switched the view already, but refresh. Uh, thank you for reminding me. But yes, okay. So uh, yeah, so I, the way we solve this is at the grandparent and the uh, sorry at the mom and dad level, you have to add the word virtual. Um, which is known as virtual inheritance and then that solves that problem actually but we will talk more about virtual probably at the end of the week after we talk about pointers because it just makes more I believe that's the case let me see the syllabus really fast uh, that's so 19 yeah we talk about pointers first and then virtual so we will probably talk about virtual either Thursday or next Monday. And so we will go more in depth about this. But uh, for now, just know that that's the solution. But however, th that should not be a problem. If you have a problem like that, that's a design problem again. You shouldn't have a diamond problem. Uh, and yes, there's a solution using virtual inheritance, but you need to kind of revisit how you're implementing things and figure out why you're having this sort of re- you know, why are you having this inbreeding going on? They should not be inheriting back to the same class. They should be completely separate trees. Can you please explain the difference between private and protected? Uh, I did. Pri 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 let's, let's look at the, uh, this this, the chart here, remember. So with public variables, they're accessible anywhere in the program. Um, oh. oh, I see it's horizontal. It's, it's kind of, okay, yeah. So, horizontal, you know, public variables are available anywhere in the program, outside the class and inside the class and inside of derived classes. Protected variables are not available outside the class, but they are available inside the class and inside any other derived classes. Private variables are not out available outside the class, but they are available inside the base class, but not available inside the derived class. They will give you an error saying they're private. So that's the difference between private and protected. That in the inheritance part, you can uh, you can switch it over. So for now, we should know that virtual is just a solution to the diamond problem. Yes, yeah, um, you know, because I, you know, it kind of sucks to tell you that this is problem and not give you the solution. So yes, virtual inheritance is a solution to the diamond problem. Um, however, it's it's a, it's like kind of like it's a solution to something that you shouldn't have in the first place. So I think more carefully we need to analyze why we shouldn't have that problem. And while, yes, that is a solution, we will look at virtuals in general next week, Monday or this Thursday after we talk about memory. So how do we solve this? Well, why are we inheriting from both A and Z? That's what we really need to figure out because, you know, if we have such a scenario, then can we not inherit from one of them to avoid something like that? That's what you really have to look at. Uh, okay, yep, but you got it now, right? I hope you understand it now, though. Um, okay, so... 
what else do I want to say with, with our, I mean, it's really easy for me to segue and start talking about virtuals and why that solves this problem. But what really is happening in, in shorthand is that with virtuals, you don't really create the variables until runtime. You know, normally when you create variables, they're created at compile time, everything gets set up, but you don't associate that those variables with their op, with the classes until runtime. And kind of that's what virtual does. So I think that's all I'll say about the solution to that. And by doing a virtual in inheritance here, what we're saying is don't associate that X with both of, with both grand, you know, with, with both class A and Z until runtime. And because of that, class U only gets one copy and that solves that issue. But again, you don't want to run into this problem in the first place. You, you want to stop this ahead of time by changing the sort of hierarchy of your classes. So, uh, yeah, I think I actually covered what, what I was trying to do with this, with the stuff here. So we're just going to get rid of this actually now. So now you've seen inheritance, you've seen multiple inheritance. You, uh, you've seen pretty much all there is to know about inheritance, um, at least at this level of 202. So now I think we can switch over to talking about aggregation or composition. And so, uh, and by the way, we I haven't really, even though I, I, I introduced object-oriented design, I didn't talk about the three principles of that, which are encapsulation, uh, inheritance, and polymorphism, but you have now kind of know two of them so far. Encapsulation, by the way, is the ability to combine data and operations into a single unit. So that idea of putting everything in the bucket, you know, operations and data, is uh, encapsulation. It's another way, putting it in a capsule or a bucket. I like bucket, but I guess capsule is a more standard term. And encapsulate means put it in a capsule. I guess mine would be embuckination, bucket nation or something, okay? Inheritance, in short, is the ability to create new objects from existing objects, okay? So you're basically making these new classes from existing ones, which extend their functionality. The third part, polymorphism, is when we talk about virtuals and stuff like that, we will talk about it. Polymorphism is basically is the ability to use the same expression to denote different operations. Uh, an example of polymorphism that you kind of know already is when you do the, the plus symbol in C++. You know, if you're doing it on integers, it's adding them together. If you're doing them on strings, you're concatenating them together, which is just splashing them together, right? But you just put a plus and the compiler figures out which one it is. It's a little bit like polymorphism, but there's more to it than that. So, yes, in bucketization. That's, that's going to be on the midterm, guys. Yes. Okay. So, um, the other sort of concept that is sort of alternative to inheritance, but I did mention, is uh, this aggregation concept. And if we go back to what I talked about last time, I did mention that term as uh, here. So normally when you think of inheritance, you say is a relationship, right? So if I inherit a, if I have a class B that inherits from A, I can say that B is a A, you know, it has, you know, you can say you, you um, uh, if, if a kid inherits from their parent, you know, they say that they, they are a, uh, you know, whatever their family line is, you know, they is at, at this point, because it has every property that the parent class has. The other alternative is instead of doing inheritance, you can do aggregation, which is basically taking a class and putting an object of the class inside of the other class that you're working with. So for example, suppose that I wanted to create a class here called uh, home or house. You know, this is where they live. You know, probably like in the south or something. I don't know. So, um, in this case, the, the the house class. You know, we wanted to, we want to have a, a a mom and a dad in the in the class. Okay, we want to have that. We could even have a granddaddy in there. Okay. However, if I use if I try to use inheritance, not only do I run into like the diamond problem and all this mess of things. But also, it, it doesn't really make sense to say that a house is a granddaddy or a house is a mom or a dad, okay? It doesn't, it doesn't make sense to say that it's an A. However, we can say that a house 
has a granddaddy living in it, it has an A or a mom, or it has a Z or a dad living in it. It has these things in it, Not it's not part of them, it just has them. So how do I achieve such functionality? Quite simple. I can just go ahead and create an object of them. So I can say an A called mom and a Z called dad. And I can even have a granddaddy in there called uh, grandpa, I suppose. Grand, how do you spell grandpa? Like that. Okay. This is just like declaring other variables. You know, I, I could I could even throw in an integer there. And put in put in um, um, let's put actually let's put an X since we're we're so into this whole X situation. Okay. And now it doesn't even matter if I have the virtual or not. Let's get rid of the virtual because we're not using it. We just have to uh, if we we're gonna keep that in there, then let's remove this so we don't get the error from the diamond problem. In this scenario, you know, we have a mom in the house, we have a dad, and we have a grandpa. Because we can say that a house has a mom, it has a dad. A house is not just a mom, or it's not just a dad. It has these things in it. So it's storing them in there. We, uh, we can, in the class, we can store integers, we can store strings, we can store these, all these built-in data types, but we can also store custom data types to sort of allow more functionality. So we're saying in this house, we can store a mom and a dad, and a grandpa okay so that's the alternative to inheritance how is that going to modify how you access the objects well what you asked normally you know when you're when you're accessing from you you can say like you foo you can say you dot and then h i'm assuming that's public because it, it auto completed uh yeah it's oh just have a random you appear there and so on right so the way you access them is you access them as if they were basically the, the original class you know you just do u dot h u dot x u dot whatever when you're doing composition however you know we have our house called uh uh cabin so it's a cabin if we want to access the variables from the mom we have to do why is it not auto completing oh, i hate it when it doesn't complete let me see let me try to compile and see where the errors are um well, of course, there's an error there, but it doesn't tell me anything. There's no errors. Why is it not autocompleting? I don't know. Cabin dot. I guess I don't have any. Oh, they're all private. That's why. Let me make them public. In fact, no, I'll keep. I was gonna say I'll and just put a struct instead of a word class in there. But now I'll keep. I'll keep a class. I don't want you to start using struct randomly. Uh, okay, cool. So now it'll auto complete. So cabin dot, and there we go. So cabin has a dad, it has a grandpa, it has a mom, and even has an X in it. So if we want to use this X, this X is very clearly referring to the local variable X here. It's not referring to the granddaddy's X or or the or the mom and dad because they also have an X in them. If I want to access the variables from the mom, I can hit mom, and then I can use another dot, and then I can access the mom's X. I can also do the same thing with the dad, but I think the dad inherited protected. No, it's public as well. Really? No, is it? Mm. Class A protected granddaddy. It should be protected actually. I don't know. I think that's gonna, even though it, 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 it let us do it, I don't, I don't know. It's kind of sketchy. Yeah. Okay, that's what I thought. I don't know why uh, the compiler was letting me out of complete it, because yeah, X is protected. So I don't know why it's just uh, being all cool about it. So interesting. Interesting that it has an X list in there because it's protected. So I shouldn't be able to access it. You guys see why you should be able to access it, right? Because I inherited it protected, as you said. So, uh, you know, it's not allowed to be accessed. So for some reason, the autocomplete was like, yeah, you're okay accessing that. Uh, my guess is it's probably getting confused with the granddaddies because the granddaddies public it didn't see the fact that we inherit protected so the ide is like whatever so as you can see ides are not perfect i do believe the age is public i'm not 100 sure on that um actually am i did i get them backwards am i changing the i meant to change the uh who's who who's mom and who's that i forgot 
Uh, oh, yeah, yeah. I'm changing the dad. I meant to change the mom and all of this. This whole shebang was for the mom, not the dad. So here, the mom is the one that for some reason it's letting me complete it. But uh, yeah, we'll switch it to like the Y. The Y is public, so that will be okay. Yeah, so there you go. So as you can see, if we want to access the X from the mom, we can't because it's because it's uh, protected. So we would need a function for that. So uh, we could do something like um, int get X and then return X. I don't need to specify which X because at this point I don't have any ambiguity issues. So I can go ahead and say see out cabin dot mom dot get X like that and uh, it's one of those oh here we go the zero line here that's that's the x of the model okay so that's the other alternative to inheritance is to just create objects and put them inside the class so again when should you use one or the other that sort of is a and has a is a useful thing but in reality think about it this way do you want the variables to be part of the same class or does it make more sense to make them as, as, as an object inside of the class? Um, if you're if you're trying to do a hierarchy of something, more than likely you want to use aggregation. Very rarely will you want to use uh, inheritance unless you're sort of building on top of it versus adding components. You know, in assignment three, you have you have your you have you're making a plane, and the plane has engines. A plane is not made up of engines; it has engines. So it makes sense that the engines are their own objects so that you can say something like plane dot left engine and then plane dot right engine. That's the other thing. If you need more than one instance of a class inside another class, you can't do that with inheritance. You could try to do something like, I don't even think that, I don't even think you can do that. Can you do something like, you know, class, let's just say class U inherit class a and then class a again can you do i don't think you can i think that's going to cost you some obscure errors let's see what area it gets here class does not name a type oh like uppercase duplicate base type invalid duplicate base type invalid and duplicate base type invalid so uh you can see there that it's basically yelling at me for a duplicate base type. It's kind of an interesting error issue. So if if you need to have, you know, multiple, let's say that let's say that this house is like, you know, shared between families, okay? If you need to have multiple moms in there, you can't do any you couldn't do this with inheritance if you wanted to because you could only inherit one instance of it. With um with aggregation it's very easy, you know. You can just go ahead and do another A here and call her mom two and then bam um oh well if you don't forget the semicolon then you're good now you're good okay so essentially if you need to have more than one instance of it inside your class because like for example and and the airplane has a left and a right engine right so you need two engines you can't inherit that way you have to use aggregation for that scenario and it's it's good like that because then if I want to access it, I'm very clear because I'm saying like airplane dot left engine dot speed or airplane dot right engine dot speed. And it's very clear to say that one is talking about the left engine and one is talking about the right engine. So that's going to be your uh, aggregation and composition. And between both of them, the idea is again to write less code and have the code that you've written easily modifiable. Whereas if you change something in a parent class, then um, you can go ahead and it will propagate the change to any classes that derive from that. So it's like you have your blueprint, and if you change something in, in, in the most basic level of the blueprint, you know, it'll update everything else instead of having to manually do it at each level. You know, it's like, you know, if you're building a house and you just change it from a certain brand of brick to another brand of, brand of brick, then you change that in the, you know, the shopping list of the brick and it'll propagate to all the stuff they're using bricks to use a new type of brick. There, I suppose that's a bit of an example. Any questions about aggregation or inheritance? Otherwise, we shall move on to talking about pointers. Let me see if there's anything else that I want to mention from the book. 
Um, otherwise, just ask questions because now is your chance. Composition aggregation. One or more members of a class are objects of another class type. That's the definition in the book, in case you're curious. If you want to read more about protected, it's on page 769. That's uh, talking about inheritance with protected public and private. Destructors in the derived class. Oh, ooh, ooh, okay. Uh, let's not talk about that until we talk about inheritance and things like that, because there is such a thing as a virtual destructor as well. <laughs> things get nasty there. Mm. Although, we, I guess within the context of when they get called might be a good idea. So let's do that. Um, what was the difference between inheritance and aggregation again? <laughs> inheritance is... Is oh here is a, yeah, you're seeing earlier is a relationship composition. So inheritance is like when I'm doing the mom and dad versus granddaddy. So I'm taking granddaddy's um, yeah yeah. I'm gonna review constructors in a second because I want to show you the order of how they happen with inheritance and composition. That's actually something worthwhile spending time on. So yeah, I will definitely do that in a second. But first, let me let me let me clarify inheritance and composition since somebody asked it. So. Uh, Inheritance, you know, we have a class A that is inheriting. So the, when you notice inheritance, because you see the colon there, and then you see how it's inheriting, and then the name of the parent. And then doing this method, class A, if I want to access in main, you know, if I have an AA, and I want to access the, 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 the parent classes or the super class of, of, or the base class, all, all mean the same thing for all sense and purposes, of this, of class A, which is granddaddy, I can do A.x, right? That's how I access this x right here. On the other hand, if I do composition, that's if I have a class GGG or whatever, and in there, I can throw in a granddaddy. In that case, in both of these methods, in this case, I can create a GGG object called GG, and then from there, I can do GGG dot, uh, well, give it a name, give granddaddy a name here. Otherwise, you, you won't compile. So we'll call granddaddy's GR, okay? So we will do ggg.gr.x. So both methods, the inheritance method here, and then the uh, composition or aggregation method here, both of them give me the ability to have this variable x from the parent class. In this case, with inheritance, it's part of the it's part of the the class that a. You know, we, we, we can access it by saying a.x, just as if it was here. Just as if we literally took the body here and threw it in here. With aggregation, we are creating a brand new class, but instead of inheriting, we're just creating an object of the class that we want the information from. So in this case, we're creating a granddaddy object. If you want to access x, you would access it this way. Notice the difference in this versus this. This requires two dots, I guess. This requires one dot. The dot is a member access operator. So we're saying that x is a member of granddaddy object called gr which is a member of class ggg over here we're saying x is a member of class a even though it's not in here it's a member of that why because we inherited it from that okay so uh that's the main difference now you're like well this is easier because i got only one dot instead of two and this is less writing it's more than that because if I want to have two granddaddies inside of A, I can't do that with inheritance. Whereas I can do that with composition by just creating another granddaddy here and just giving it another name, G2. And now that guy has ggg.g2.x, you know, and there are different x's. So aggregation composition allows me to have multiple objects of the same class. Inheritance does not. They're for completely different purposes. Both are perfectly valid, but you just have to kind of Get a feel for when one is better than the other one, um, and so on. Yes, yeah, exactly. It will be like inception of buckets. It really, it really is. I actually wanted to use that example at some point, but I forgot. So yeah, in a way, that's actually a, a that's actually a, that's beautiful. Like, I have a tear coming out because you said that. You know, I feel proud. Um, you know, if we want to use pictures. We got with inheritance, we're literally like, you know, we got bucket A. This is bucket, this is bucket granddad. 
Well, let's just let's, let's for let's you know screw the grand that stuff. Let's just do a different example. Let's say this is a this is a um, a, a you know a bucket of roses, okay. And so now we are going to literally copy and paste it. So we, you know inherit the entire thing. And then hopefully, even though you don't have to, I mean, you could inherit the exact same class and not do anything to it. That'd be kind of dumb because why don't use the original class, you know, but you want to add something to it. So now this bucket of roses is also going to contain maybe like uh, uh, roses and also, shoot, I don't know, flowers. Uh, sunflower. Okay. So it's a bucket that can contain roses, but it also now has a sunflower. It's the same kind of bucket. And then aggregation, like it was well beautifully said, it is buckets inside of buckets. So it's making a brand new bucket. It's a brand new bucket. This is going to be our, 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 our dome depot bucket that we make. And we are going to put a roses bucket inside. And any other buckets that we have, you know, daisies. Yeah, so we have a bucket of daisies that could be another class called daisies. We can throw that, throw that in there. And not just that, but here's a cool advantage. We can throw multiple buckets of daisies in here because we're really into daisies. I think I know what daisies are like. I think they're white. Let's Google pictures of daisies now. I'm curious. Daisies, Katy Perry daisies. That's not the daisy I was thinking of. Yeah, that's what I was thinking of. So they're little white, they're white daisies. Okay, they're, they're like white sunflowers. Like if you inverted the sunflower colors or something. So yeah, okay. So yeah, this is uh, this is good, cool. So yes, yeah. Tears of happiness. Daisies are in an AC and AC and H. I don't know what that is. I don't know what AC and H is. So, uh, anyways, cool. So, I'm glad that you guys asked. Cause, like, frankly, if you just stay quiet because you're afraid of asking for the whatever time it is, you know, then you will never find out, and then you will bomb the test and whatnot. So, it's better for me to repeat it. Since either way, I, I kind of dedicated the full day to talking about this. So, that's only I'm only moving to pointers because there's no more questions on it. But let's do the construction, the constructor thing in the meantime. Maybe in the meantime, more questions shall appear. So, uh, yes, okay. So um, let's talk about how, you know, this will be a good review of constructors, but also how, how the whole inheritance and composition affect constructors and when they run, okay? So let's clean this code up a little bit. Maybe 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 we'll do a new code, because that way I leave that code in there. So if I share it, if you want to play with it eventually, then, uh, const, you know, I don't know, it's an interesting name that I picked there. I was trying to say constructor inheritance, but... Too much to type. So uh, we might still do. We see. We, we never did the ship DLC, by the way. We can do that later if you really want. It's just there was a lot of writing that we would have to do for that. So uh, let's get rid of code since I copy pasted. Um, how does this get rid of everything? So, hmm. I'm trying to think of an example that's not just letters. I guess the flowers. Let's go with the flowers. Yeah, why not? So, um, let's make a bucket class. That's actually, yeah. Let's make a class called bucket. Bucket type. Uh, a naming convention that people like when they're making an object or a class. No, I'm sorry. An object. A class is to put the word type after it because it is in, the, in a way it's a custom data type so bucket type and our bucket type is going to contain a variable called uh, size which uh, basically tells us how big it is okay other than that maybe we can contain a string color and that's it okay and from there uh, before we even go on to the inheritance let's make a constructor so remember for constructors what you need to do is you need to put the name of the class and then put parentheses. If, and then if there were any parameters, you can pass them there. So in their case, we're actually gonna have two parameters and the S 
and a C, which are going to represent the size and color, but we will have a default parameter that we will set the size to be, um, the size is a number. I was trying to say zero, one, two, three, four, but I kind of like just using large, medium. Now nah, we'll do numbers. So we'll say the size, you know, the higher the numbers, the more the, amo the amount of uh, cubic liters that it fits or cubic gallons that it fits. Yeah, cubic gallons sounds better. So in cubic gallons. So a bucket probably holds about maybe like four cubic gallons. If you were talking about like a medium sized bucket, you know, it depends how you like your buckets. So uh, I, I don't like them too big because then they're heavy when you fill them. So why get a big bucket if you're not gonna fill it all the way? So uh, yeah. So in our case, the default size is gonna be three gallon bucket, okay? And then the color, the default is going to be blue because in my head, I'm thinking of a blue bucket. I don't know what the default, what, is, what color are you guys' buckets at home? I'm assuming red maybe, but does anybody have like a, like a black bucket? A white bucket I could see if it was like a paint bucket, but no, no, see, white is like a paint bucket, but not like a like a general purpose bucket, you know. Unless you're talking about painting, I've never seen a a truly a white bucket that was just meant as a general utility bucket. Yeah, blue seems to be like the standard. Red I could see because I know some red supplies, but like I've never seen like for example a oh no, I seen yellow buckets in Home Depot. I have seen them, so. Well, no, no, they're more like orange, actually, because they're like the, the color of the logo, I guess. But look, yeah, anyway. So we'll go with blue for our standard, okay? But, uh, you know, what we'll do is we will initialize it. Now, remember, here's a reminder how to initialize variables. One way to do it is just to do something like put the variable name here and then put the parameter in. The other way is, is you can just do to color here and then put in what you want, which in this case is C. Okay, so both work, you know, don't do, don't mix and match like I did. I'm putting both so you can see both ways so you can refresh your mind. I have like two white buckets, one red and one blue in my garage right now. You know, are you sure your white buckets are not paint buckets that were repurposed? I want pictures on Discord after class of the white buckets. I don't believe, I don't believe white buckets are real. <laughs> like, like original white buckets. We need to make the second default parameters a string, right? Uh, oh, yeah, 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 good point. My bad. I, I, I don't know why it became a string. Thank you. Good cat. So, uh, yeah, okay. So, uh, yeah, that's that's good enough. We're going to make sure that we make everything public. By the way, always make your constructors public. I don't even think you can make a constructor private and get away with it. Bad things happen. Um, so, yeah, don't, don't mess with that. So, uh, yes. Um, what else do we want to do with this? Maybe a function, you know. Let's get a let's let's do a function called. Uh, you know, we could go fancy. Yeah, we could go fancy. We could make the the color of the bucket protected. We're only going to allow certain colors here into the bucket, and so first of all, we're going to need a setter and a getter. So let's just get to do the getter first. So string get color. Is just going to be return color so that's not you know why do this in the first place like that i agree this is pointless but it will be more point more pointful pointless i don't think that's how that works in english it will be more useful to to uh when we do the the setter because the setters will be going to gain control by having made it protected because uh we are going to have a parameter which is a color and then uh by the way if you want to make this by reference but want to make it safe, here's a reminder. You can just put the word const in front of the, the, the type and then put the ampersand there to pass by reference. And now this is a safer, uh, it's, a, it's, it's safe passing by reference, which is faster than passing by value. Although here we're just passing a string, but, you know, but it could be something big. So, uh, okay. Now uh, we are only going to allow, you know, uh, if C is not... Oh gosh, gotta think of Boolean logic here for a second. Okay, I'll just I'll just kind of blur it out and then we'll figure it out. If C is not equal to red or C is not equal to green or C is not equal to blue or C oh or C I think no, 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 I want to use and, not or. Yeah. 
boolean logic and c is not equal to so we got red green blue uh orange and then i think that's it right because we, we don't believe in, in white buckets so there you go <laughs> uh don't forget your quotes then we're gonna basically say invalid color you know see out invalid color accepted uh why buckets are fake news actually we don't know they could have put a different color in so we'll just say your um comma and then c buckets are fake news. yeah there we go um otherwise and then and then we, we can just hop you know, we'll, we'll reset the color to say C equals, uh, or not, we'll just not modify it at all. Yeah. Otherwise, then we'll set it to be that. Okay. So what we're doing is we are controlling, uh, we are controlling what kind of data can be put into the color variable, which is a good usage of protected, right? We're only going to allow colors to be put in. So they can't put the color turkey because it's like, what is turkey? Did you mean torqua? or what right so and we're limited only the certain buckets that we're going to allow people to have which are red green blue and orange we're not allowing white buckets i guess so yes okay so let's see if this works before we play with the inheritance part of this so let's try to make a bucket called bucky and then uh let's see what oh you know what else we want to have with this which i've been preaching along if we want to have a print function you know so we can see the details of the bucket so uh, bucket maybe, maybe we'll print out the color first we'll say see out color bucket uh is or has a capacity of uh size gallons Okay, so now we can actually do buck, buck print. Ah, oh, oh god, so many errors. Uh, before it, oh, never mind. That's because we are still compiling on the other one. Although, why do we have so many errors on that one? Oh, let me let me get rid of all this stuff. So otherwise, when you guys get the code, you're gonna panic. Be like, oh no, this doesn't work. Let me just fix that. Okay, there we go. That's this. Let me switch over to this one. Let me close it as well. Okay, so now we can. Uh... Okay, so blue. Okay, so we got a couple of issues. We need to put a space here. Also, um, I kind of want to uppercase the, the the letter. So, uh, but I don't want to modify the original variable. So I'm gonna I'm going to. Uh, I'm gonna make a temporary variable here on, on this called string uh, temp, and I'm gonna set it to color, but then I'm going to uppercase the first letter of that. So that will be temp zero. But first let's error check. Let's say if temp.size is greater than one, or greater than or equal, or greater than zero. Yeah, that will be don't go out of bounds if for some reason there's no color set, which there never should be because we initialize it, but Write safe code, you know, always be safe. Then you can say temp zero is going to get temp zero, but we're gonna call to upper, to uppercase it. That should make it uppercase. And then we can print that out here. There might be a better way of doing this, but that's just kind of what came to my head as I was typing right now. So there we go. Now the blue, the, the, is, the, the B is uppercase in blue. So it uh, looks prettier, okay? I don't know, there was something about it that bothered me. Also, the, the fact that we're missing a space there is disturbing me. So I will fix it. Yay, it's pretty nice. Okay, so blue bucket has a capacity of three gallons. Good, it works, perfect. Okay, the last thing, even though we're not using it, just as a re reminder, we can have a destructor which is the tilde plus the class name. Again, the structure will be more useful when we talk about bar, uh, pointers and dynamic memory allocation. For now, we're gonna say recycle bucket. 
because we all want to recycle our buckets because they're probably made of plastic and that could probably be recycled into another usage of plastic like uh, maybe a water bottle or something so always recycle guys save the planet so recycle bucket okay that is a construct and also maybe we are in the constructor so that we know that we just made a bucket we can say uh, bucket purchased because that's when we purchased it even though technically that's more like when we build it we'll just say bucket purchase then okay because they built it after we purchased it. It was a custom made bucket. So you can see that we got our constructor and then we got the print sound function and then we got the destructor, okay? So cool. So far, this should all be reviewed, but uh, you know, let me know if there's something you want me to, to refresh here. Okay, so now let's go ahead and improve our bucket. Um, let's make a bucket 2.0, okay? Um, yeah, yeah, because the whole purpose of this was, I had to remember, the purpose of this was doing a, a constructor. So so now we're going to get bucket uh, v2, okay? Or upgraded bucket. Yeah, that sounds better. I'm not a fan of using numbers like that for actual proper variable. So upgraded bucket, yeah. Okay, that is going to inherit publicly from our original bucket. Why publicly? Because uh, we have a public variable that we want to keep public, which is the uh, the size of the bucket. Somewhere in here was a size. And this protected will allow us to be able to mess around with the color if we need to. The destructor gets called when the object goes out of scope. What that means in plain words is when the object is no longer used because the function finishes if you're not using the memory allocation what the you know the space that the bucket was using gets returned to main memory to the operating system so that it can be used by other programs so if i declare an object here called bucky and i use it and the program ends in this case the function ends even though it's also the program bucky gets returned so that memory can be recycled and used by other programs and so the destructor is uh, procedure that runs before that happens. Why do you want to do that? Again, when we get to dynamic memory allocation, there's a better usage of it, which is basically you want to free up memory that you that you dynamically allocate it to avoid memory leaks. That's the the real reason. But again, to understand what that means, we have to talk about memory, memory leaks, and all these things. So it'll make more sense for now. The destructor isn't really doing much, so it's okay. Although I did find a creative usage of the destructor in the assignment three, which was I think to uh, to close your file that you're reading in, something like that. So that was the most creative usage that I could think of that was not dynamically memory allocated. So at least they gave a purpose for, for the destructor then. So that's probably the assignment you see it for, used for. So anyways, we got our upgraded bucket. Now, chat, what shall we do to our bucket to improve it? Maybe, um, what, add, add a color? You guys want to add white to it? You know, eventually we... Uh, you know, we have protests that they wanted to add different colors because they, they, they like more more buckets in it. Give it a handle. Yeah, handle is good. So we're going to give it a handle. And by that, I'm saying we're going to give it a variable called uh, uh, handle color, maybe. But tell me more about the functionality. You know, do we want to add anything to the to the bucket in terms of functionality? Um, it's kind of hard because it's a bucket, you know. It's like <laughs> it's a bucket. So uh, what? I, I don't even know what a spout is. Hold on, let me Google that. What is a spout? Oh, oh, a hole. Okay, a lid. Okay. So uh, let's go. Let's see which one C plus plus wise. Let's go ahead and give it a lid. Okay. So yeah, we'll get, we'll do the lid. I think the lid will work. So uh, we the, the lid is gonna have a size. Okay, so so int actually, you know, the lid can be its own object. So let's go ahead and make a class called lid. Lid type, and this lid class is going to have a size associated with it, and also a whether it has a spout or not, since you guys said has spout. Okay, and let's also give a constructor to this called lit. In, although in this example, we're gonna do the constructor outside of the uh, class. We're not gonna do a default parameter for that one because I'm, you know, we're gonna 
kill the time. No, we'll do them because otherwise, yeah, 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 yeah. We'll do them. Uh, size gets. This will be in inches, I guess. Two inches. So int s gets two, and uh, has spout. We're gonna set to false. I, I keep thinking ahead of me here. Bool h, and then size gets s and has spout false in python you have to capitalize true and false so i kind of want to capitalize it but i shouldn't H. okay that's our constructor for now uh, we'll put a see how making a lid and then with type recycling lid. Give it wheels so you don't have to lift it. Uh maybe if we do the third one we'll give it wheels. Okay. So uh yeah, okay, so we got uh what's the purpose of the tilde again? That is how you tell it that this is a destructor. So a constructor is just a class name. A destructor is a class name plus a tilde at the front. It's a, it's sort of the uh, indication to the compiler that that is a destructor function. So yes, that's why you see a tilde in just about all of the destructors. So uh, okay, so now that we gave the, the lid, the lid is its own thing because it makes sense to say, you know, that a bucket has a lid versus a bucket is a lid, right? Same thing actually for the handle. The, ha the bucket has a handle. It doesn't have a. Uh, it does. It's not. It's not a handle. You know what I'm saying? So in this case, okay, we, we're going to make it into a variable here, like that. Uh, you got. Is that supposed to be there? I don't know. Oh no. Uh, let's see if there are any typos in there. Uh, expected line 43. So that will be here. Uh. We forgot an L at the front of line 39, so that is here. And then the last one is we have a, in line 50, that one. Oh, save. Oh, I see. We have to earn them int there as well. Okay, we're good now. We're in business. So thank you for the heads up on the double lesson signs. Which is the uh, that would be the insertion operator, stream insertion operator. So yeah. Okay. Um. So let's go ahead and add a lid to the upgraded bucket. You know, that's going to be the main sort of thing about it. Uh, this the handle color. You know, we can probably cheat and just literally inherit all of this stuff. Yeah, we can do that. We can do class handle type. Because really, in fact, you know, you know, oh, no, no, because the handle doesn't have a spout. Because I was going to say, we could just literally inherit lit type and call it handle, but uh, there's no spout on that. So never mind. That, that won't really work. Um, you know, we'll, we'll say class handle type. Let's make this public, by the way. Does an object constructor get inherited as well? Yes, it does. It does. And, and that's kind of what I want to get to because the, the trickiest part is how you call the constructor from the inherited object. That's what some people have a hard time with. So that's kind of what, I, what I'm what i trying to to work up to. So maybe let's not add, let's not, let's not add the, the handle for now. Or if we do, that's just an empty class. Okay, like that. That's fine. Okay, it, it doesn't have anything in it, but it, it's fine. Okay, so now in the upgraded bucket, let's go ahead and throw in a lid. So we're gonna call lid type lid. We're also gonna throw in a handle. And then we also wanna add functionality by adding an additional color that the bucket can have. And because of that, we need to modify a function from the original class. And I wanna show you that this is possible to do. Uh, all you really got to do is write the function there 
and uh, in this case we're overloading it or sorry overriding it actually so it's basically the same function as before but we're adding the ability to have a white bucket in there okay and so now compiles everything is good so let's talk about what I just did before I run it okay so I went ahead and created an upgraded bucket that inherits from my original bucket, which means it has all of the functionality of this. There's no private variables, it's only protected in public. So that means that I have access to everything in the upgraded bucket if I want to change it. Uh, one of those things that I want to change actually is my original set color function was limited to working for red, green, blue, and orange. And if I fed it white, it said it was not a valid color. So now I am, you know, I I I I did I did a I did a what do they call it? Uh, marketing research, and I found out that white buckets would sell pretty well if I actually added them. And so I went ahead and I want to allow white buckets to be there. So because of that, I have a function that says that if there's white buckets, it gives me an error. So what I want to do is I want to overwrite the function in the derived class. So now, while this class takes everything from bucket type, I can overwrite the function set color with my own custom set color function that had, you know, in this case, I copied and pasted and just added the white to it. So now, if I call set color to my upgraded bucket, it will use this one instead of the original one. You can do that and that adds power because you may want to inherit a lot of things, but you may want to tweak some things around. So remember those three things I said for inheritance is you want to add data, add functionality of your original, of, of add data, add functionality, and modify functionality of the original class. So adding data, we added the lid types. Adding functionality, we can, we can add a function here that tells us, uh, if the lid is open or closed. So let's add an int, uh, a, a bool that says is open, you know, and then uh, we'll have to put that in the constructor here. So uh, upgraded bucket is open. So we'll set is open to false because we sell the bucket with the lid closed. And then uh, we can check whether the, bit, the, the lid is open or closed, right? So one of the functionalities that we can do is we can say is bucket open of course you know it's public but we can make it private and that way we can add the functionality and you can say see out if is open you can see out yes else see out nah okay so again, you can add more data to your to your derived class. You can add more functionality to your derived class, such as the fact that we have this is bucket functionality, if it's open or not. And you can modify existing functionality, such as the set color that you can modify, okay? So these are all things that you can do. So now comes in the cool part, or the fun part, let's talk about the inheritance of the constructor and how to work with the multiple layers of constructors that we have here, okay? So let's make a first a upgraded bucket just to make sure that everything works. Oh, another thing that we're going to have to modify is probably going to be your print function because the print function is currently um, limited to not printing out whether the lid is open or closed. So we want to add that in. So one of the options that we can do is I could just overwrite it as I did with the set color. But instead, um, I, I, I still I, I want to just take advantage of the current one I have. So I do believe that I can just call print of the base class. So I can say bucket type print. So it prints out the original print function. But then in addition to that, I can say, I can then call out my uh, is bucket open function. So uh, we can say stat, uh, bucket lid status. And then uh, at this point I can go ahead and say is bucket open. that okay so that's gonna be my new print function is gonna still use the old one but add to it so that's another thing that I can do I can call my old one and then just add stuff afterwards or I can completely modify it uh, however because of that I, I do need to put the scope resolution operator so that it knows that otherwise it's trying to call the same function which will not end well it will end up in infinite recursion recursion is something we will talk about uh, okay oh, yeah, we are finished making that so upgraded bucket type is gonna be called uh, uh, the bucket uh, 
upgrade a archetype is private. Oh, did we make the constructor? Oh, I forgot to put public in here. Public. There we go. Okay, cool. So let's run it and let's kind of see what's happening here. So we purchased a bucket that was Bucky. Uh, we went ahead and printed out the details of Bucky. And then we purchased another bucket. That's going to be the bucket. Okay. From there, we are making a lid. Then we're recycling a lid. That's because uh, the function ended. And then we're recycling two buckets. Okay. So this is a little bit misleading because if I go ahead and in this constructor say purchased upgraded bucket and then call the function again and also uh, maybe in addition to that let's call the print function of uh, of the of the upgraded bucket and then maybe also uh, let's set the color to it the bucket dot set color to white since that's our new color right people want to buy the new color because it's the hip color so okay cool so let's look at this slowly bucket purchased that is coming from the constructor of bucket type and it is related to bucky and it, then we go ahead and print out the details of bucky which are that it's a blue bucket with a capacity of three gallons and then we get bucket purchased again okay bucket purchased again there it's coming from the base class the bucket type and that is coming for the the bucket one okay so that's coming for this one technically and then we say making a lid making a lid is calling the constructor of the lid class okay we still have not seen purchase upgraded bucket we only see that in the next line so what's happening is when you call a when you create an instance of a class that is a derived class, it's going to first run the base class's constructor, and then it's going to go ahead and run the constructor of the class that you're working with, which is why we see bucket purchased. Then we see making a lid because it's creating the lid because it's in there as well. And once it goes ahead and initializes those objects in the class, uh, and if we had something here that said, if, if handle type had a constructor as well, it would say, you know, making handle, then you would see that even before purchase an upgraded bucket. Where are you using the lit type again? Uh, I just created an object inside of upgraded bucket called lit type here, right there, using my aggregation technique versus inheritance. And I'm also creating a handle here. And now you will see that both print out. Ah, damn it. Where did I have a typo? Uh, handle type, handle type. Oh, this is private. Here, screw that. Let's make this one a struct. Okay, so now, bucket purchase is coming from Bucky. This is also Bucky, and that's where Bucky ends. The rest of this is, except for the last one there, is is going to be from the upgraded bucket. So for the upgraded bucket, first we get the constructor of the base class runs, initializes any of those variables, and then the next thing you do is we initialize or we, we, we allocate memory for the variables that are inside of upgrade bucket, which is lit and handle, okay? So that's where making a lid and making a handle come from because it's calling the constructor of those objects. Once we've sort of constructed all of the objects, now we can run the constructor because that is going to initialize. Let's, let's flip it around. Suppose that the constructor of the class ran before the constructor of the objects inside the class of the variables. Well, the constructor of your class is used to initialize things, right? We can initialize the color to green or whatever. But if you haven't built the objects themselves, then you can't initialize them yet. So you have to first create all of the variables before you can fill them in with information, which is why the constructor of the variables runs first, which is why you see making a lid and making a handle running before you run the purchasing a bucket, which is the constructor of the, of the upgraded bucket, okay? Furthermore, the first thing you see before you even see the local variables is you're seeing the constructor of the base class run. That constructor will always run first. Now, suppose that it was a three layer of inheritance. You would run the super classes constructor and even before that okay let's let's look at the even more complicated example suppose that the super class has variables of their own those variables will be initialized if those were objects then you will see the constructor of those run then the constructor of that will run then 
you get to the middle tier class where you will have the constructor of the base class that just ran, and then you have all of the local variables that will be created, any constructors that need to be run for that, and then the constructor of this class will run, and then you go into the to the third layer of the class, which you just had the constructor of this one run, and then you just and then you create any local variables there, and then you do it. So if you uh, if you want to see a picture of that, you know, if we have a situation where we have class A that inherits, you know, class B that inherits class C. What's going to happen is if I create an object of C, it's going to first go all the way up here. And then it's going to look at A. And it's going to initialize, or sorry, not initialize, it's going to create all member variables in A. Okay? It's going to create those variables. That may include calling their own constructors of their custom data types. It may or may not. If they're integers, then there's no constructor for that. But if there's a string, there's a little constructor that sets the string to be just blank and things like that. From there, once it creates the variables, it's going to run the constructor of A to fill those variables that we just created. If, if it needs to. It might not, it might not but it, it might. It depends on what the, you as a programmer did. Okay? And this is all just because we're making a C. We're not, that's all that we have in main. We have a single line of code that's making a C. Okay? So this runs. After that runs, then we are going to look at B, and we are going to already this ran. Okay, this was this ran and this ran. But now the third thing that's going to run here is we're going to create all member variables in B. Okay, if they have their own constructors or their own inheritance, that has to be dealt with at this point. If none of that is there, then we can go ahead and run the constructor of B, which will initialize all of these variables probably, hopefully. After all of that is done, we can finally look at initializing, or sorry, I keep saying initializing, of creating, slash allocating potentially, um, all of the variables, all the member variables in C. And then we're going to run the constructor of C to initialize these variables hopefully okay so all of that will run in the order that I just said from top to bottom just to initialize that and that order is in critical importance because otherwise you try to you try to initialize a variable that you haven't created yet that's a big problem right like you're like yeah set x to 5 and you know the, the, the computer's like who's x what x why x where x you know what basically like that okay so uh, that's an important order that you're gonna have to sit down and maybe rewatch this piece of the video to kind of feel, get a feel for. Okay, so uh, don't feel bad. But here's the thing: right now it's calling all the default constructors per se. But what if I want to pass to the uh, constructor of like bucket? You know, I want to set the the bucket that I make. Because right now, if I if I was to call print bucket before setting the color, or actually, yeah, ignore the color. Just looking at this, you know, it's a white bucket has a capacity of three gallons, okay? Bucket lit status nah, which means that it's uh, open or closed. It's, it's closed, okay? Suppose that I want to initialize my bucket with a capacity of five gallons. If it's Bucky we're talking about, then uh, I can just say something like, uh, which one goes first? Is it the integer? Yeah, I can just put in five here. And then if I run this again, you can see that I have five bucket, five gallon bucket. But if I try to do that with here, I can't. At least as I have it right now, if I put a five there, it complains because it says no matching function call for upgraded bucket type. It means that there's no parameters. There's only one constructor that takes no parameters. So, so it's basic. Oh, shoot. My bad. Apologies for that. Uh, so what I did is, uh, apologies, apologies. What I did is, um, I, 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 you know, as I have it right now, as I had it in the past here in a second, so let me undo what I just did here. Um, is I, I run it, and as you can see, I have a bucket that has a capacity of three gallons and three gallons. So what if I want to change it to initialize to a different one? Well, I have that set up in my default parameters, so I can just put a five here, and then that, now I, I will initialize by setting that to five, as you can see now, the Bucky has a has a has a uh, a size of five. Okay, so that is how you change that parameter. 
However, suppose you know that, that I want to be able to do that here. If I just do it like this, I get an error. And that error says no matching function call for upgraded bucket type and then int. It says that there's one that has no parameters. Basically, this is saying that you have a default parameter, uh, default constructor with, with no parameters, but you're trying to feed it a parameter, so no such function exists. So you're like, not a problem. We can go ahead and modify it. So uh, <laughs> I, if I go in here and then um, and then go ahead and type in like int again or int s size, and we're going to say the default is 3 again. The question is, is that is that enough? Can I go ahead and, and do something like, uh, you know, I can size equals three or size equals s, I suppose. And the answer is yes, you can do that. But there's a better way because we already have a constructor that deals with it. So now the question is, can we call the default const can we call the constructor of the superclass with something other than the default parameters? That's what we really want to do. So while this is a solution to this, there you know, and, and I suppose it can be useful if uh, if it's just something basic like that. It's a better choice to just have that happen when you initialize the parent class. So that'll be again the top layer of the of the hierarchy that I was doing. And so the question becomes, how do I call the constructor of a parent class? And I'm going to pull it up before I forget. There's a link on Geeks for Geeks that has uh, some examples that, I, that I'm going to share. I think it's Geeks for Geeks. Uh, no, this isn't the best one. Oh, by the way, why are they using... Oh, I wonder if that's a thing. Somebody was... They just decided to do... Um, so, is this is this okay right now? Yeah, okay. They said that you can run out of nowhere. You can replace these parentheses with curly brackets. Oh, my God. It's not even letting me do it. It's, like, confused why I'm doing that. But... Uh, Huh? It works too. Okay, interesting. So I guess when you're doing your construction initialization, you know, I told you to use the parentheses, but apparently uh, curly brackets work too. I didn't know that, but now I do. I learned something. But if you do it this way, it doesn't give you an error. So don't, it's a thing they added in C++11 that you can switch from using the, the parentheses to curly brackets. It's a thing that you can do. So, uh, well, no. 11 lets you do it even, normal Normal lets you do it even with these, like with the parentheses. But 11 did is they allow you to switch the parentheses to use curly brackets. So that's that's a new thing that they did. So anyway, uh, anyway, I, 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 just, it, I just stumbled upon that when I was looking for the link. But I can't find it. Ah, oh, here we go. I think this is the one. So I'm going to post this on, on, on uh, Twitch. Uh, oh, if not, it'll be in the, in the, in the video description. Um, yeah, this has some nice pictures, so that might be useful to you, but somewhere in there should be the example. Uh, that might not be the one. I wonder if I can find it. Anyways, here, this one, this one has some, this one, you can look at the code on that one. But anyways, so what you do is quite simple. It, you kind of use the same sp method here, but now what I'm curious is if, if, if using, uh, the reason why the curly bracket thing came up was because, so what you do to get the uh, the, uh, the, the non-default constructor is you can go in here and just like you can initialize variables here, so I can do like is open false, you know, I can do something like that. I can also call my constructor that way. So I can do bucket type 
and then pass in the parameter of the size to it like that. And I can also, you know, if I want to be consistent, I can also get the, what was it, the color for the second one. Except now my default can be white, you know. Or actually, let's do, well, no, we haven't done black for the colors yet. So that would be violating the rules. Uh, let's say the default is, what else do we have? Orange? So let's just switch the default to be orange now. C. Like that. But now, what I'm curious is if, if I can use the curly brackets there. So, but first, let me, let me show you that this works just fine. So, if I run it now, you can see that I have the same functionality. I can put here that. I can then go ahead and do white. You can see it says white bucket. Oh, well, it has white because I have the set color here. But if you comment the set color out, you can see that it says still white bucket because this time I set it from the start. But now, here's the cool thing that I am calling the constructor of the base class by using the colon. Now what I'm curious about, what I found earlier was, can I use the curl, the, it doesn't even, it just doesn't like me using that. Like it's just, even the autocomplete here is like confused. There we go. If I can do that. Oh, well again, if I add the flags. So yeah, I guess I can. You guys feel free to do that in your assignments, you know? I, 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 I it bothers me, so I'm just gonna, I'm gonna stick to my old method to use parentheses, but yeah, curly brackets will work. So that's that's new. I didn't know that. I'm gonna show that to uh, to Ben, see see if he knew about that. But uh, yeah, that's cool. I mean, it just feels weird. See, when I think of the when the curly braces, I think of the scope in C++. You know, function scope, class scope, custom scopes that you make, that kind of thing, right? I think of the parentheses as parameter related stuff. Or, or or logical expressions sometimes if it's an if statement, but you know here you're using the curly. I mean that's like that makes me wonder if 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 uh, if something like this will be valid. You know, if if five is greater than six, you know, see so yeah, wow. Instead of using like the curly the the parentheses. Yeah, okay, good. So in there, it doesn't work. Okay, so at least I feel better that it doesn't work there. But apparently, it does for the function. So you see, like, it would be just, it's, I'm, I'm used to parentheses for that kind of stuff and curly braces. So you learn one way, and then you're kind of stuck in your way. So, so um, yeah, now you've seen basically uh, constructors and the ordering that they get called, how to call a non-default constructor, which is, again, it's similar to how you initialize variables, except here you call the constructor. And... Uh, well, yeah, yeah, well, yes, you can. That's what I'm doing up here. I'm using the size and the half spout. So, yes, you can use that notation to initialize variables as well, just like that. But, yeah, so a similar notation that you use to initialize variables, you can use to call your constructor from the parent class. Um, and, again, the order says that that, that call will happen before the code runs from the constructor. So, uh, and as you, you can see that happening here in the order of the text, okay? Right there. And, and, and I guess for the destructors, um, the destructor of the, the ordering of this will be backwards for the destructor. For the destructor, you will have the, the, uh, the, the it'll go from the outside in. So it'll first call the destructor of the or, or actually no 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 it should should mm. Mm, which one well here let's just check by having a destructor in the upgraded we didn't never added a destructor here I think it should actually be the it should be the check the base class first but it might be backwards I'm not 100 percent sure I'm trying to think of cases where each one would cause problems so let's just check it Recycling bucket of upgraded. So it's calling. Okay, so it is backwards. So it's first call. So so when you're constructing, you know, when you're when you're constructing, when you're calling your constructor, you go from the uh, parent class all the way into the class that you're working with. So first you deal with A, then B, and then finally C. When you're doing your destructor, you go the other way. You start out from the C and then you work your way back to the A, okay? 
So that's why you see here that first you're calling the uh, recycling bucket of upgraded class, then we're recycling the lid, and then we're calling recycling on the um, on the on the on the parent class, and then the recycle bucket here is probably from Bucky. One of these two is from Bucky. So yeah. So that's uh, I'm glad that that came up because actually it's kind of important. So yeah, with the constructors, you will we'll practice more about constructors when we talk about dynamic allocation, so pointers and stuff, because that's really when you really can start taking advantage. I mean, constructors, yeah, initializing variables is pretty useful. But the big part of constructor and destructors is the rule of tree and dynamic memory allocation. Yep, ABC for constructing and CBA for uh, destructing, deconstructing. And again, for when you're declaring the variable of C, right? So yes, ABC for constructing, CBA for destructing. And this is all just for that single declaration of C, okay? Suppose that you did BB. B. What would be the order in that case? What would be constructing and destructing? What would be, if I, if I did the declaration, same architecture, same everything that I have so far, what would it be? Maybe there's a delay, so I shall wait. There could be a delay in the video, so I'm just chilling. I'm waiting. I'm, I'm waiting for you guys to tell me. What would it be for constructing? If for C, it's ABC, and the constructing is CBA, what would it be for creating an object of class B? <laughs> Lowercase b. It would be AB. Yes. So you would do AB for constructing. And then BA for destructing, okay? Deconstructing. So that's what it would be, okay? If you're creating an object like this. And then, of course, if you just made an object of A, then that would just be A for constructing and A for destructing. That's just that. Okay. Yes, it, was, it wasn't a trick question. It was just make sure you guys were awake. All right. So uh, anything else? Any other additional questions? This concludes... Two out of the three main concepts of object-oriented programming. Again, we got encapsulation, which you learn of putting data and operations on that data together. Now we kind of understood inheritance and the idea of reusing code, you know, extending classes, aggregation being an alternative to that. Uh, to be able to achieve polymorphism, which is kind of like trifecta of uh, object-oriented programming, we will have to learn a couple of other things. We will, have, we will talk about runtime polymorphism and compile time polymorphism, which we will achieve using different tasks. But before we can get there, well, we could talk about compile time by templates now, but before we go to that, we are gonna switch gears and talk about pointers and dynamic memory allocation. So that's gonna be, uh, it's gonna be interesting stuff. So uh, if there are no more questions, then that's the end of that. Could you show the destructor for the upgraded bucket type another time? That's just uh oh gosh, what's happening here? Hold on. All right, sorry about that. Uh, I just put the word recycling bucket upgraded. I just added that like last minute. So uh, again, that's just a tilde and then the class name. And then uh, it's called recycling. Why was it AB again? A, B, because if you have an object of B class and you're creating it, it needs to first call the constructor of A. And before you even does that, it needs to create the variables in, in A, then call the constructor for A, and then it can look at the variables in B and create those, and then call the constructor for B. For destructing, on the other hand, it calls the destructor of B and then the destructor of A. For C, because you have the chain of A, B, C, it's fast to look at creating the variables for A, constructing A, creating the variables for B, constructing B, creating the variables for C, constructing C. Could you go over the syntax of constructors again? The syntax of constructors is going to be the name of the class. So this is whatever we have here. You just put that in as the function name per se. Constructors do not have a return type. They're, they're neither void nor value returning. They're just sort of this weird twilight zone in between. 
because they don't have anything. They just put, they just literally put that. So if, in the most basic of sense, so you don't get confused by all the fancy bucketness, is uh, if you have a class A, I love open casing that, you know, a constructor for this class will be just A like that. That will be your default constructor. If you want to have more than one constructor, you can. You can do something like this. And then do whatever you want to do there. Okay? Uh, alternatively, you could have also a constructor with uh, default parameters as well. So you could have something like A. Uh, int A int E equals zero. Uh, oh, that one's going to cause ambiguity. We need to have at least one more. Like that. Okay, now we don't have ambiguity. So, uh, yeah. You can have more than one constructor. We're just kind of been sticking it to one. But you can do something like this, and that would be perfectly fine. Um, it, if you want to do a destructor, the default, it would just be tilde, and then that. That one doesn't ever have parameters. So don't ever think about parameters with a destructor. You will never run into a situation like that. Uh, let's see where we had a typo here. Probably here. Okay, cool. So there you go. That's the most pure example. Now, the other thing you probably don't remember is how do you actually define? Because I was going to do this earlier, but then I ended up not doing it. How do you cr define the uh, constructor outside the class? So suppose that you wanted to do this one outside the class. You do the, the class name, scope resolution operator, the constructor name, which again is the class name, so it'll look like AA, and then you can do your parameters int c int b equals zero and then write it like that although i don't think you need the equal part in there so yeah you don't need that part so let me get rid of that there we go okay so uh it, it doesn't like you putting the default parameters in there you could put the variable names, just not the default parameter. And so there you go. That, that's how you do a constructor. If you want to do a destructor outside the class, you know, you could do that too. Boom. You know, it's a destructor. It, it destructed itself. So yeah, that's the syntax. So that should uh, kind of refresh your mind upon that. So... Anything else? Otherwise, we're done. No problem. Why would you want to do them outside the class? No pup today. She's not here. Huh? She's AFK. Um, because A, you want to make your code look nicer so it's more compressed. And technically B, it, there is a difference. When you do something inside the class, it's called an inline function. And it functions differently than how it works outside. So uh, we don't really get into that detailed of the, of the actual C++ language. But uh, if you Google inline functions, you will get more details on that. But uh, in the simplest sense, it's, it's just not cool when you write a class and there's so much stuff in it. Like I, I do that in class here because it's faster. But uh, this just looks messy. It looks much cleaner when you have things out separate like for example when we did, when we did the uh, the ship type like look how clean this looks you have all your functions you have all your variables and that's it that's all you need to know that's your blueprint then you can go ahead and define that right remember that idea of of uh, abstraction and the uh, of, of you designing the class and then implementing it this is me designing that i'm going to have a take off a take damage and so on and not have to worry about the implementation somebody else worries about that so it's much better to do that sort of definition of, uh, of your functions somewhere else and keep this sort of clean and easy to read. So uh, that's that's the long answer to why you would want to do them outside the class. Not just for constructors, but for functions as well. So, cool. No problem. All right then, I shall go and find my dog. So, uh, I shall see you all tomorrow. So uh, until then, make sure you get your homework turned in. And if you have additional questions, you can always post on Discord, all right? So have a good day, everybody. See ya.